this is Gray Hughes of Gray Hughes Investigates on YouTube. I did this interview with Mike and Becky Patty back in 2018. You can see that they're really great people, and or you can you can listen to them. And uh, I just want to say that there's a lot of people out there that for years have been attacking the family as if they're somehow involved in the murders. And what's even worse is there's so many people who believe that garbage. It's absolutely disgusting. But if you're somebody out there that just wants to hear from their own mouths various things regarding the case and about Abby and Libby, uh, just check out this video and let me know what you think in the comments section and hit that like button for me. That would be great. All right, so let's get started on the video right now. Can you tell us about Libby? I feel like that is something that the media doesn't cover quite as much. Uh, Libby was a gentle soul. She uh, was very laid back. She took after her dad a lot in that respect. Derek's very laid back, and so is Libby. Um, it's hard to it's hard to make her mad, but boy, when she, if she wasn't happy with you, she'd let you know. Um, she was a defender. If kids that um, if anybody w was bullied, she would be right there to step in and protect them. She, um, she, you know, she thought a lot of people. Um, she would go out of her way to make a, her teachers feel better. She would leave us notes to find. Um, I was out doing inspections one day, and I went to put my sun visor down, and and on the back side of that sun visor was a sticky note. And that's the one that has been seen out there a few times. Um, that um, I love you, and I don't know what we'd do without you. That's just the way she was. To, she liked to make people smile. She uh, left a sticky note for her band teacher, and said, and for him to find, and it said, "Band is awesome. You make band great." Yeah. And she just she just did that to her teachers. She had. Every time she had a new teacher, that was her new favorite teacher. She just loved them all. Her and Abby both, they would, uh, teacher would write a pass for them to go down to eat lunch with them. Um, they just, uh, they got along well with all the other kids. Libby loved sports. Well, she loved, she just loved being busy, period. Uh, if it wasn't her practicing or doing sports, it's what are we going to do this weekend, Grandma? What are what, you know? What are what are our plans? And if I didn't have plans, she was calling Tara. Hey, what what are you guys doing this weekend? So she was always doing something on the go, whatever. I've had many teachers come up to me, and still, still, uh, in junior high, they still have a place on the wall for the girls. Even though they would have moved on, it's it's almost like it kind of held still there in junior high. Those teachers talk to us every time they see us about how they miss how they miss Libby and how they and Abby and go on about how they just made their lives better. Well, in the summertime, she played softball. Uh, she'd played softball since she was four years old, except for one year. One year, she decided she was going to try baseball. She was about six years old, and she played baseball with the boys one year. Um, and then she went back to softball, decided she liked that better. And uh, she would, as soon as softball was over, there would be a few weeks, and practice would start for soccer. She would do soccer in the fall, and as soon as, by the time soccer was over, she was playing volleyball. And um, she did volleyball, and by the time volleyball was over, it was time to condition for swimming. And after swimming, she had, uh, um, and there was there was a few weeks there, and then she would be starting on softball again. So she was in a sport probably 11 months out of the year. Um, her, if I was to say her favorite. It would almost be a toss-up between softball and swimming. She loved both. And in the last year, she had really started coming into her own on in both sports. But, uh, no, I talked to her coach, and they put her in the 400. And by the end of the season, she was loving it. She only swam it about half the year. 
and she improved she improved a full minute or more off of her time in that half a year wow. um, eighth grade they were conditioning and she was excited about doing the 400 again and she she come up to me one night and said oh i'm so glad you did this because you know what i don't ever get tired now when i do the 50 and the 100 i'm not tired right. so you know <laughs> she she realized the benefits of of being a long distance what was the friendship like between abby and libby abby was here abby was always quiet when she was here um of course kelsey says she wasn't that quiet when we would be out but of course we're the adult figure so she was always the the shy quiet one and i think how they really became friends was <laughs> when um they both started playing that they both played volleyball they played volleyball on the same team um they were both they played uh they were both in band and they sat they both played the alto sax and they sat side by side so they had been in band for two and a half years together they had played volleyball because volley volleyball was already over so they had had played volleyball together for three years they were so different, but yet so alike. They both loved crafts. They were both, I'm sure you've heard Anna say in some of the interviews that, you know, she was always trying some new craft, that she had a whole big closet full of craft stuff, that she would do this, this, and this. Well, Libby was kind of the same way. Um, she got on a kick of uh, the duct tape you know, all the different collars and designs. And she was making everything. You know how they say you can fix everything with duct tape? Well, that's what she was doing. Except she was, she made a purse and a billfold, book covers, out of all these different, these different duct tapes. She, she took a spell where she was, where they were doing those little rubber bands and making bracelets and stuff there for a while. Oh, we, we found those little rubber bands everywhere. She was making those all the time. They both love to paint. Um, we have several pictures that the girls paint. As a matter of fact, there was one on Libby's wall that um, her uncle was involved with the church in Flora, and they were having an art show. And uh, they asked if uh, we would bring Libby's stuff, her art over, uh, and hang for a, an exhibit. So we said, yeah, yeah, we'll do that for you. Well, when I was taking some of the stuff down after the exhibit, I happened to look on the back of one of the paintings and actually it was Abby's painting that she had made for Libby. They, they painted, as a matter of fact, the night before, um, I have the partially finished painting that they were working on. And it was funny because it's done in brown and across the middle of it, it says chocolate. So, you know, they were working on a sign that said chocolate. Libby seemed to be a fantastic photographer. Is that something she enjoyed doing? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, her and Kelsey both, they love photography. And a lot of those pictures that I do post of Libby, it would be, and Kelsey on some of them, the two of them would go out. There was... Uh, uh, one of them was a day when uh, there's a picture out there of Libby where she's peeking out of the corn. And that was the girls that day just going out, out in the yard, down the driveway, just being silly and out taking pictures. Um, they did one in the winter that uh, I'm going to say could compete with any professional photographer. Some of the pictures that those girls took. Um, they love doing scenery, uh, flowers. They like doing those little close ups of flowers and um, but yes, they were, uh, we, we got both of them starter cameras. Well, actually Kelsey had two. She gave Libby her old one when she got a more advanced camera. So the two of them had nice cameras to go out and take pictures with. She was, she was very smart, very intelligent. Um, and she did, she would think out problems and, um, just, she, uh, she could, she just figured things better. You know what I mean? Different. Yeah. Um, 
I'm going to tell you, she was a whiz at math. She would help her. She'd help Kelsey with her math. And Kelsey was three years older than her. But she just, uh, she just had a knack, a knack for things and figuring things out. And she loved, to, she loved to do that stuff. What about you, Mike? I was a big one with sports and and Libby. Um, you know, spent a lot of time with her. Just you know, training her how to hit a ball, how to catch a ball, how to you know. Um, we worked on a lot of things out here. You know what I mean, I'd make up like a fake net that she had to hit over for volleyball because she wanted to serve so bad, you know what I mean, be good at it, you know. Yeah, yeah. she just work and work and work at it. And I, was, I had to pick her up from practice. I mean, that was kind of our routine. Be Every day I'd pick them up from somewhere, you know what I mean, whatever practice it was. or That's all changed, you know. Yeah, it's just uh, totally. people don't understand that our lives have turned 360 degrees <clears throat> and another 180. You know what I mean? I can't, it's hard to explain, but nothing yeah. is the same as it was. Nothing is how how we've had it planned. Um, definitely wasn't in our life plan here. You know? Yeah, it's a complete nightmare, is what it is. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because she was. Uh, Really, both both the girls. I say this, and I really mean it. You know, not just because, you know, they've uh, they've been murdered and they're gone, but they truly were good good kids, both of them. They were, uh, yeah, yeah, just good good wholesome teenage girls that, you know, did their schoolwork, did their studies, played sports, stayed out of trouble, and uh, were just enjoying life. You know, like a couple kids should. And uh, somebody come along and change and ruin that, you know. Yeah, it is. Both girls planned on going into some type of law enforcement. They already yeah. had their career paths planned. Libby was wanting to go into some kind of forensics, and Abby was actually going into law enforcement. They both had already, would, you know, was starting their classes um, to, to to go in those paths. Maybe you could speak to the people who wonder why you let the kids go to the bridge at all. As if it was so unsafe they shouldn't have gone there. Uh, I imagine that the town before this happened was filled with people who felt really safe. They probably would leave their doors unlocked at night and garage doors open, much like other small towns in the United States. Well, you... uh you basically hit right on it, you know. Yeah, people leave their doors unlocked, leave the keys in the car, you know. Garages, garage doors opened at night. I mean, that's just the way it was. And and uh, unfortunately, this changed all that. Uh, don't know if anybody does that stuff anymore. But, you know, and, and why did we let them go out there? Well, that's because that's where all the kids were. There were kids there before them. There were kids there during. There were kids there after. I mean, that's part of the trail system that, that Delphi has been building as a community or as a city, you know, as an entertainment draw, basically, to the town. Something else, if you go into Delphi, and you know how all the little towns have, like, flags or decorations on their light poles as you go through? Some of the flags on the Delphi one says, celebrate Delphi trails. It, you know, they act like we took them out in the middle of nowhere and dropped them off, but this is part of a trail system that the whole town advertised and everything to bring people here they weren't yeah. anywhere that kids and families and people went all the time and i'm aware that they say that there's a drug problem and and this and this there's no more of a drug problem here in delphi indiana than there is anywhere else i don't care what they say if you look at statistics i'm sure it's not any worse than anywhere else and I'm sure the average person did not know. I, I, they're saying out there that that well that you know there was meth and stuff being made out there. Hearing that from people from somewhere, that's the first I've heard of that after this all happened. Right. You know. Right. <laughs> all these so, people have all this information, but nobody in the town had that information. But they, all these people that live in Timbuktu, all have all this inside info, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't understand why somebody would try to cook meth right there where people went a lot. There were joggers that used to jog that trail. Well, I think it's because it makes a more sensationalistic story. Well, it yeah. would. It, that's probably it. Because you know what? We have tons of corn. I mean, we're very rural. 
why not go out in the middle of a cornfield somewhere and do your meth lab instead of right there where people come? Hey, you can't say that too loud. It made too much sense. Don't say it. Don't. So did, did Kelsey and Libby go out to the bridge sometimes together to take photos prior? Yes. They would go out. Actually, there's a, I think, a picture, my cover picture on my Facebook right now is Kelsey, Libby, and um, their cousin. Um, yeah, they, they would go out. They went out there with their other grandma. Uh, the summer before. I mean, they've they've been out there many many times. That's that's what they that's what they do. Uh, yeah, I'm just laughing right now because what's Mike cutting? Onions? Because man, that, <laughs> yes, that, that, listen, that thing sounds like an avalanche on each. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Is it? It's not as bad as your airplane you got flying over, dude. Come on. Yeah, okay. I'm just saying, boy, that thing. Make sure you get a glass of ice cubes too and jingle it around a little bit. Okay, here we go. Here we go. If you're ready, maybe you can take us back to the events of February 13th, 2017, and walk us through that day. Well, Ab- Abby spent the night with Libby on Sunday night, um, and they they had stayed up late through the night um, painting their chocolate painting and messing around i we actually have a couple of videos that they had taken of each other that night kind of goofing around um they slept in because they were up late uh when they got up um it was my, i don't know probably 10 or so and uh derek made them pancakes they had pancakes and and look of course, Libby always wants to be on the go, and she was wanting to do something. But Kelsey had to work that day. I was I was working, and and Derek uh, took off to go take some pictures for me. And uh, so I told Kel- uh, Libby she'd kind of gotten into shopping shopping recently. She enjoyed shopping, which was new for her because she used to I used to have to drag her with me to buy her school clothes. Because Libby has started enjoying shopping. Uh, I've told her that I have some filing to do, and if you girls want to do some filing for me, I'll pay you, and, and maybe later on today or tonight when I'm done, we could go. So they came out and were doing some filing. They were out with the file cabinets filing and stuff, and uh, Kelsey came out. It, see, I don't know the exact time of that. I, you know, why would we have paid attention to that? Right. But she came out, it was probably close to one and said, Hey, I work at four. I'm going to go to a friend's house for a little bit. And then I'm, I'm going on to work. Well, as soon as Libby heard that, Libby jumped up and said, Hey, will you take us to the bridge? And Kelsey said, I don't care. And she looked at me and said, grandma, can I go? And I said, well, you've got to have a ride home because I, I am working. I can't stop to pick you up, you know, until quitting time. And I'm not, I, I just don't have the time to do it. So she said, well, I'll just call my dad. Well, I assumed that she called her dad. Um, I didn't specifically say, Libby, did you call your dad? I assumed it was done. Um and another thing that I automatically tell kids when they have a friend over, when they ask if they can do something, one of the things that I automatically say is, is it okay with their parents? You know, I, that that's just anytime somebody spends the night and they want to go do something, I'll say, well, they have to ask their parents too. I assumed everything was okay when she came and said, hey, we're leaving. She uh, called her dad on the way, but it's because she knew that he would never tell her no. He, ne- Derek never told her no for anything. Not that she ever asked for anything unrealistic, but if she asked him to do something, he, he just did, he did it. It's just that, and if he would have said no, I guess she would have uh, come back home. Kelsey would have just brought her home. But there was no reason for him not to. He was taking these pictures. It wasn't but three miles out of his way to swing by and pick her up. So it wasn't a big deal for him to swing by and pick her up. Um, and that, and they did. That's, that's when they left. But I, I do know that the last things that I said to her, she was standing in the doorway of the office. 
and um, I told her that she needed to uh, take a jacket just in case it got chilly. And she said, I, I, don't, I don't need one. I don't, I don't need a jacket. And I said, Libby, take a, take a jacket. And she said, it's okay, Grandma. Mm -hmm. And she was standing there with that smile that she does. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't say anything more. I said, well, if you get cold, you know. And that was, uh, that was my last, her standing there smiling at me, telling me, Grandma, it's okay. So um, they, they left here uh, right around, give or take a couple minutes, they left here right around 1.30. Uh, what I do know is Kelsey had said that she was talking on the phone to her boyfriend when she dropped them off. And uh, I looked at phone records, and it shows that she called, or the call come in from her boyfriend at 138. So she was talking to her boyfriend at 138 when she dropped them off. That's when the phone call started. So I don't know how long she talked to him, and I don't know how many minutes it was to get there. But she dropped them off, and she watched them. She said she watched them until they got to the into the trailhead, and then she pulled on out and went on to her friend's house. So when Derek got done taking his pictures in Frankfurt, he, he came back to pick Libby up. He come up 75 and came across the country roads um, to pick Libby up. Because uh, it's the easy way. That's the way we always go that direction. That's just how you do here. Um, so he when he was, there's a bridge. It's called Wilson's Bridge. And he said as he was crossing that bridge, he called her. Uh, again, we checked phone records. And it was at 311 that he called her to tell her to, he was going to tell her, Hey, come start heading up towards the trailhead. I'm going to yep. be there in a minute or two, you know, but she didn't answer. So when he got to the trail up to the, the drop off point, um, he called her again and that, and that on our phone records show at three fourteen, And he told me that as he was <laughs> getting out of the car, he called her. So at that point, she didn't answer, so he started walking up towards the trailhead. He stood there for a little bit. He looked around and didn't see anybody or anything, so he started walking towards the high bridge. He was just about to where it forks, and he ran into an older guy, a gentleman, that was coming from the high bridge. And he asked him, did, did you see a couple of girls there? And he said, no, but there's a couple down underneath. So Derek, instead of going to the high bridge, took the trail that went down to the down to the creek, to where he said that the couple was there. Um, at this, I don't even remember if he said he saw them or what. But he he yes. came walking back up, and uh, he called me. That was when he called me. It was about three thirty, and said Libby's not answering her phone, um, and I I don't see her. So we. We told him that we would, uh, Tara works with me. So I started calling her and then Tara called and messaged. We, we sent several messages. We would take turns calling. Derek did walk down to the Freedom Bridge and walk back. He passed that older gentleman again. And um, so he went back to the car and... He was, he was, like I said, he was walking and by this time it was about four o'clock. We had been trying to get a hold of Libby for close to half an hour. So I, we decided, okay, we're, we're, we're going to go look for him. Tara and I were here. Tara went ahead and took off. I had to let the dogs out and I called Mike at that time and said, Hey, uh, Libby's not answering her phone. She's at the trails. Uh, we're going to go and look. And he said, okay. He says, I'm on my way. I'll leave work. Um, I'll, I'll be there as soon as I can get there. So as I was walking out of the house to leave, so I was maybe five, 10 minutes behind Tara leaving. She went ahead and went. And that's where, and when she got there, Derek got in the car with her. And I know there are some People that have said they saw Derek in a car with somebody, and, and they did. They saw him sitting with Tara for a little bit, for a bit. He was explaining to her, and, and uh, 
so that they were waiting for the rest of us to get there so we could uh, figure out what, who was going to go where to search. As I was walking out of the house, Cody come pulling in. He had just gotten off of work, and he asked me what I was doing, so I told him what was going on. So Cody got in the car with me, and we decided there's two different ways that those girls could have walked home had they decided to walk home. So we drove both routes to see if maybe they decided to walk home, maybe something happened to our phone. The only thing we could figure at that time is maybe they had fallen down a hill Maybe they were hurt. She maybe because she always has her phone in her hand most of the time, and maybe the phone dropped or something. That's that's what we were expecting as they were down a ravine somewhere and couldn't get out. And then by the time we got there, there were other vehicles there, uh, several of them, to the point that I had to park across the road. I, I pulled into the ditch across the road. Because there were so many vehicles. Some of those weren't ours. There were several, at this point in time, there were several people there that was not family. So we started looking for the girls. Now, I I don't remember a lot of the walking because at that point in time, I called AT&T. Um, because Libby had reset her phone the week before. Uh, because it kept glitching, it just kept catching, it kept freezing up on her. So she reset the phone to a factory reset, but when she did that, she didn't reset some of the different apps. So I called AT&T to ask them if they could ping or what trace her phone. Because if you have, you know, my that thing, trace my phone or whatever it is, is an app. They could, you could do it. So I know that they probably could trace her phone. And I, I got the runaround. I got, I kept telling them that she was lost. We couldn't find her. I needed somebody to trace her phone so that we could maybe find her. Um, but they, they told me they couldn't do it. And then she told me, well, there was this app that I could do and, and do it. So I downloaded this app and everything. And I said, okay, what do I do to, 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 to do it? She says, well, you got to download her app on her phone. <laughs> don't you understand? Don't you understand? I, yeah. I, I don't have her phone. Right. So I, right. I was on the phone with them quite a while, arguing with them that, that this was very important. It was urgent. And I wasn't getting any any help from them. And about this time, it was, it was, it was about a quarter after five or so, because Mike come walking up. He had been searching, too. When he got there... Um, like I said, there were a lot of people there. There wasn't any place for him to park. So because there was no place for him to park, he pulled into Mears' um, their driveway. And Mr. Mears happened to be there at that time, and he came come walking out. And he asked, he, he told him what was going on and asked if it was okay to park in his driveway. And he said, yes, that'd be fine. So then that's when he came over and was, was searching too. And he had searched for a while and he happened to be walking up to me and it was quarter after five. And I said, it's going to be dark soon. We need to, we, we really need to uh, call the police. So when we checked the phone records, he, uh, the time the police call was about 520. So, uh, and when he did that, I wasn't able to get a hold of Anna earlier. So I tried calling her. I couldn't get a hold of her. So I told him, I said, I'm leaving. If you're calling the police, I'm leaving. I'm going to Anna's house. I've got to get a hold of Anna. So I left there and I went to her house. And there was a family member that answered the door and Anna wasn't there. And they said that she was at work. So uh, I left a message there that if she happened to come home. And so I left and started to where Anna works. And about the time I got through town, she called me. She had gotten my, she had finally gotten my message. She was at work. She didn't see it. And so I told her that what was going on and Mike had called me at some point in time or something and told me that they told us to go to the police station. So at that point in time, Anna and I met at the police station. And Mike, what do you remember from that day? I said, I usually get off anywhere from Typically four, four thirty, five o'clock. It just depends, you know, for um, whatever business is going on. Sometimes I'm at work way late. Other times it's not. But uh, 
an average day would be probably four, four thirty. And Becky called and uh, said, "Hey, can't get a hold of Libby." You know, she they went. To, she went to the, the trails. You know, her and her and Abby. Like I said, I, again, we didn't know exactly what time until we actually looked at, at phone records because you don't pay attention. You know, I'm like, yeah, hey, great. Yeah. I'll knock yeah. out of here. I'll be up there. You know, help you. I'll meet up with you at the trails. So as soon as I got there, like I said we all walked around and and I t- did talk to the to the landowner there. Um, I'd actually called another police officer I know and asked him if they could could track a phone. And he said, yeah, he's, he said, just go ahead and call in to the sheriff's department. Um, they can kind of help get that initiated. So we did that. That was all in the same time when, when I was walking the trails and saw Becky and she said, hey, we need to call the police. It's going to get dark soon. So I called the police and said, hey, this is what we got. And I like can help track, you know, ping this phone, see if we can't get it going. And I actually went back because I was back at the truck. I walked back down the trails. And so literally within probably 10 minutes by the time I left the truck and walked back the trail and I was walking back towards town, I ran into two officers coming at me um, down the trail. So they had, they had deployed immediately, you know, upon my call. I think it was a city officer and a county officer. And we saw each other and said, hey, did you see anything? Nope, neither one of us did. So they spun around and and then I think that's when I ended up going back to the police station so we could get them phone information so they could start pinging. Becky was already there, Anna was there. And it was a long night of coming up with anything we could do with phones. You know, I ran back out to the house here and got any iPads or iPods or computers or anything electronic gadgetry that I could come across to uh, take back in so they could review through all that. And I had a uh, cousin works at a uh, local TV station and he got wind of it and came down and it was on the news that night that we were searching. And of course I got buddies on the fire department and around town. And once they got wind of it, they started pulling people in. So the search continued. all evening long in fact even all night long there was people out all night do you guys have any theories on what happened we go back and forth on this truly Mm -hmm. you can you can play any scenario in your head you know uh yeah yeah because of knowing the you know the area could he could be local but then again it could have been somebody scoped the place out delphi did uh Right. They did advertise the trails. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, there's there's so many scenarios. Do we do we tunnel vision down to one person? Not at all. I look at everybody equally. So I won't say yeah. We think maybe he's local because I, I'm not gonna. I'm not going to. I won't even, I don't even want that out there because I don't want people to start focusing on local and miss the perp if he's not local. We in, in no way do we want to lead people. You know what I'm saying? We don't want to, we don't want to lead anybody to think one way or the other. We know they crossed the bridge. We know where they ended up. We know that, you know what I mean? At some point in time, they crossed it or something, whether they were running, whether, whether they were forced. We have no clue. And like Mike always says, there's only three people that do know, and right. two of them are not right. here. Hey, Mike, I heard you made some extraordinary efforts into looking for clues. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I actually uh, put together a team of people, <clears throat> told law enforcement uh, what I was doing and that we'd be out there. Um, and <clears throat> actually kind of got a, made a map of the area and... Put, did a grid system and assigned people to specific areas and told them to take a, take all the time you need to go over it with like a fine tooth comb. You know, walk back and forth. Don't leave anything. I want I want to see everything covered. So if there's anything out here, we all had little flags we could stick in the ground if we found something. Found a couple items, turned it in. It didn't end up proving to be anything, but nevertheless, we covered it best we could. So. 
Can you tell me about one of the more creative things you might have done to help find clues? No, I was getting ready to jump in the creek one day. I had a pair of shorts and tennis shoes. I was going to go walking, and uh, FBI and state police came up <laughs> in the area, and they said, "No, Mr. Patty, we're going to we're going to be walking that. We got underwater sonar." gyroscopes or something, you know, I mean, all their underwater <laughs> yeah. Yeah. metal detecting capabilities and, and, and cameras and stuff. And he said, we're going to walk this whole thing. Okay, we combed that area pretty good. I mean, we really did. Not saying there's not something we missed because it's obviously I don't know the exact route that he left, you know, right. or where he right. went, you know, but um, pretty much covered about every, every direction leaving the crime scene. Yeah. That's what my yeah. goal was. I had thought maybe of using a GoPro on some sort of extendable stick and film anything that was underwater. That, that was the thought that I had, but you know, I'm sure the FBI has a little bit better equipment than that. But that, I, th yeah. I think they're, they're, yeah, I think they're a little bit better on a GoPro on a, on a stick. But <laughs> hey, that was a great idea. Yeah, it was. Idea. Come on, it was a good idea at the time. Yeah, brilliant. I was going to ask you guys any rumors that you'd want to just kind of clear up. Well, the big thing is Mike didn't do it. Yeah. I didn't swab him. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Talk about that. What was, his DNA in. Tell me the genesis of that thing. I want to hear about that one. Well, there's just a, a rumor that has been going around that I I am the one that swabbed Mike and took his DNA and took it in. And that that's not the case at all. An FBI agent came out here. Um, they only have one FBI agent that does everybody, so it's done consistently. And he has he took all of our, our whole family. Yeah. yeah. They have a single investigator pulling all DNA, you know, uh, samples from from everybody, whoever they deemed that they needed to get DNA from. Yeah, well, I, what's amazing is people actually think that. An agency like that would be so cavalier and say, hey, hey, Becky, uh, would you mind doing a swab for us? Bring it in. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, think about how you, ludicrous that you, is, right? <laughs> you, you're correct. That, that I mean, is not how it works, you know. Right, yeah. It may work like that on TV, some of these crime shows. I have no idea. But in the real world, it comes down to dealing with facts and data. And that's what the police yeah. do. Anything else you guys want to clear up? Yeah, yep. all these theories that are out there, Gray, yeah. one of them's probably pretty accurate, you know what yeah. I mean? Out of yeah. all, all the theory stuff, I mean, we know a few points of, uh, of fact, mm -hmm. you know, uh, where the girls were, where they were found, the fact that they were murdered, and we know we got a picture of a guy. Uh, I am strongly of the opinion that he's our killer. Obviously, the police won't say that he's our killer until they have factual proof. They deal with facts and data. That's why they say he's their suspect. You know, I use the common sense approach and say, okay, if that was whoever it was, if he didn't have nothing to do with it, I think I'd come clear my name pretty quick. You know what I mean? All right. This hasn't stepped forward. It's an admission of guilt by omission. You know, um, that's my opinion. But, and again, I don't get on there and try to sway people's opinion uh, I mean, I really wish they wouldn't. For me, it's hard for the family for you know to hear that rhetoric going on. But I, re it really doesn't bother me. It really yeah. doesn't. Well, and I also think that you've got all these groups, and people take screenshots, or people go from one group to another and say this or this. It's it's like a game of telephone. Well, by the time they go from this group to this group and repeat something here, they leave something out and it goes to something else and something yeah. <laughs> else. Well, by the time you get to the fifth group or so, it's, it's a totally different That's it's exactly a totally right. different story. We've all heard that they didn't have school that day. Could you explain a little bit about that for us? Yes, it was a, um, uh, we have what they call built-in snow makeup days. And since the win it's snow days built into our schedule, but because the winter was so, it was a, such a mild winter, we didn't need those snow makeup days. So they make a call at the beginning of February. Okay, we didn't use those, so we've been to school more than what we had anticipated. So these are the days you get off. 
So we had two of them, two snow makeup days. They were out of school Friday and they were out of school Monday. Hmm. Now, Friday, Libby spent the whole day with me. She went with me to do inspections. She went with me to do inspections and then we went and got, she got a new pair of shoes. She got her a green pair of Converse. And then when she went back to school, she was going to start a shop class and she was going to weld and stuff. And we had to get her some shoes that she could wear for welding. So when we went and got her her other shoes, we got her some shoes that she could wear for welding. Um, Mike had stopped and picked that day, that very day, and picked her up a, a patriotic welding face mask. She had spent that day with me. And then I took her to Terrace because they went to... Um, her and another friend went to the basketball game and then they all went to Tara's afterwards and they all went to a late, uh, a late movie. And, um, then Saturday she went and spent the night with another friend and then came home Sunday morning. She called Kelsey Sunday morning and Kelsey went and picked her up. And then, uh, Anna came and picked Libby up and they went to the hmm. park, uh, to practice, uh, softball. So Anna had them in the afternoon on Sunday, and then she dropped them both off here that evening. How has it been to work with law enforcement? We've, I think we've worked very well with them. Um, we, we try to help them in any way we can, and they've tried to help us by going with us when we go on the shows and stuff. So, um, we, we understand that there's things that they can't tell us, right. but we do believe that there's several of those officers that's on this case that are taking this very personally. So I know they're working extra hard on it. There's a dedicated team, both from FBI, still the Indiana State Police, the Carroll County Police, and of course, uh, the Delphi um, are involved as well, the police department. I don't know if Delphi actually has dedicated people on it, but um, the other agencies definitely do, and I know Delphi is there to support. But they still have help from all over the state or even out of state. Whenever they get a tip or a lead and they need to pull some information in from a guy in Oregon, you know, <laughs> who, uh, <laughs> who has a goatee? The guy in Oregon? Yeah. With, oh, jeez. <laughs> guy who has a goatee, has a uh, little <laughs> microphone hanging in his house. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> They come check you out. He leaves the local, you know. Yeah, I'm glad so they I, tap yeah. all those people. You yeah. know what I mean? All those are resources. Yeah, I'm just glad I didn't have that other kind of hat with the flaps or whatever on the side. But maybe they'll say, "Look at the earmuffs." That could be the, you know. <laughs> Here it yeah. comes. Here it comes. Any last things that either of you want to clear up? I want to put it out there about um, it, it goes around. There's there's a few a select few that say that our stories have changed several times that they can't really figure out a good timeline because our stories have changed several times. I would like to know when did my story ever change more in a few minutes. Now it may have changed a few minutes because we looked at phone records later on, but, or as we find out something from somebody else, because like Kelsey, she didn't even talk at first. She didn't, she didn't discuss the case until about the time we went on Dr. Phil. So, when she started talking, there's a few things that we learned that we didn't know from that day of when Libby talked to her. So as a, as with any investigation, as we have found out things, we may have been able to add to. But I'm here to say that our basic timeline has always been the same from the very beginning. There was a uh, there was a. Uh, radio show that an officer in the very beginning also said that the girls were dropped off at one o'clock by right. their father. Right. Yeah. So there's been stuff that the media in the beginning, it wasn't any of us talking. And there again, that telephone thing, somebody told somebody, somebody told somebody, and they had the wrong information and yep, they put it out there. So then when we come out and say, well, this is what happened then we're lying because somebody they had already heard it doesn't matter who they heard it from they don't check to see who said that that it really wasn't family and of course their th side is well why would out why would law enforcement say that it was one o'clock if it wasn't i actually think it was you and me remember we communicated and we came up with a, a timeline and then i put it out on 
a post somewhere and then it's kind of spread around and finally there was a, literally the okay you know left the house at 1 30 you get 1 45 derek actually was supposed to just pick them up but it wasn't a specific time remember it was derek dropped yeah. them off and he was supposed to pick them up at five that's what everybody was saying uh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's like really wow that's absolutely not even accurate at all and then so we got the truth out there but people think that that's a change of a story but it's really, mm -hmm. you had never even said the timeline until then, right? That's mm -hmm. what's kind of strange about it. The timeline had never been out there until we actually sat there and put together the, the whole thing. And you said, okay, yeah, it was actually Kelsey that dropped her off around, one, dropped them off around 145. Now, you know, now it's probably like more like 138. But, and then when they're playing around out there, they're walking. They're probably goofing around down this trail a little bit, walking down this one. You know, it take, took them a while to get to the actual bridge itself, right? And then that one picture right. at 207, right? Well, so, and I guess it doesn't matter a whole lot if, I, if I'm off a few minutes, but we do know exactly when they were on the bridge, which was 207. All right. Well, hey, listen, Mike and Becky, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you probably wanted to eat a long time ago. I heard those onions, you know, those look like... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yep. Okay. Anyways, hey, I really we appreciate have a great it. Great night. Okay, you too. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Later. Bye. All right. Well, thank you all very much for watching. I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. I hope you gained a different perspective of the family members. And uh, leave a comment in the comment section and hit that like button on the way out the door. So again, thank you all very much for watching. And as I always say, until next time. Be safe out there.